So everybody knows that Australia and New Zealand are home to some of the most magnificent natural landscapes and some of the most exotic flora and fauna that one can find on planet Earth. But isn't that the main reason that everybody goes there? I mean, Australia and New Zealand and the whole region of spectacular lands that surround these two countries are something not to be missed. I would say most people in the world world want to visit these places specifically to see their natural beauty given the fact that not a whole lot of people live in this region and even the cities are pristine and gorgeous. And if there's one thing that Australia is not that well known for, and especially New Zealand, is their high-tech industries. It's not something that's talked about very commonly on the mainstream media, and indeed even spaceflight journalists tend not to talk about these two countries all that much when it comes to their space industry. And I have to admit, even I've been guilty of that. But just for a moment, let me give you a quick look at what I intend to cover during my five-week visit to these two magnificent countries. Interested? Well, thanks to you guys, I've already been able to purchase my ticket for September 11th to Sydney, Australia. And let me give you a quick overview of all the innovative technology that's going to be waiting for me in the land down under. Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and good morning to my viewers in Australia and New Zealand. Welcome to a special bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut, where I'm going to be talking a little bit about space flight in the land down under, both in Australia and New Zealand, because I've been talking a lot about this trip that I'm going to be taking, but I'd really like to give you an idea of the kind of work that's going on in this region of the world, and it's very, very impressive. Of course, all of us know about Rocket Lab. I'm going to give you some details about what's going on with Rocket Lab, some of the newer developments. But really, a lot of people just don't appreciate just how many launches this company has actually carried out in a world where startup spaceflight companies really have a tough time getting off the ground. And we're getting three, four, maybe five rockets to orbit is really a sign of tremendous success. At the same time, we're talking about a company that has gotten to orbit 60 times from their New Zealand facilities alone. But private space flight in this region of the world is not a one-trick pony with Rocket Lab. In addition to that, Space planes seem to be a popular concept in this region, both hypersonic suborbital space planes and also space planes that are going to be capable of deploying payloads to orbit and perhaps even to interplanetary destinations. So we're going to talk about the full gamut of space flight that's happening in this region of the world. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. This is just an overview of a few companies and the kind of work that they're doing right now, just to give you an idea of how much I'm going to be bringing you here in September and October. So looking forward to meeting my viewers there. But before we go any further, let's go ahead and talk about space flight, the land down under. 
First, let's talk about Dawn Aerospace, a company comprised of 130 people split 50-50 between the Netherlands and New Zealand with a sales team in the United States. And probably the most famous thing that they're working on right now is the Aurora space plane that offers the performance of rocket propulsion with the reusability of conventional airplanes. This, of course, is something that many companies have tried and failed to master but this company seems to at least be getting test articles off the ground and they've been able to do it more than 50 times. This approach enables frequent and reliable access to suborbital space while advancing high-speed flight capabilities critical to scientific research as well as national security, which means obviously they're looking at military applications as well. And in November of 2024, the Aurora space plane broke the sound barrier reaching Mach 1.12 at an altitude of 82,500 feet and it also set a record for the fastest climb to 20 kilometers surpassing a record held by the modified F-15 Streak Eagle held in 1975. Dawn's rocket-powered aircraft are designed to surpass the altitude and speed limits of traditional air-breathing aircraft by not relying on the atmosphere to generate thrust. These aircraft will be the first to achieve high cadence and low cost access to airspace too high for traditional aircraft but too low for satellites, thereby opening up a new frontier in aerospace and research. Here's some of the industries that this company wants to exploit. First of all, life sciences, investigating cellular biology, regenerative medicine, and space health and microgravity conditions, and and semiconductor technology, testing next generation ships and materials under near space radiation and thermal extremes. And then finally, defense applications, validating communications and sensing payloads in high altitude environments. And just so you know, this is not some pie in the sky ideal that is yet to be sold to any customers. Oklahoma, yeah, the state of Oklahoma has already decided to buy one of these things. On June 12th, the New Zealand company said that it signed a binding partnership with Oklahoma Space Industry Development Authority to operate the Aurora Mark II vehicle from the Oklahoma Air and Spaceport. Flights of the vehicle from Oklahoma are scheduled to begin as soon as 2027. For the first time, hypersonic planes are becoming a real thing. But New Zealand doesn't have the market cornered on all of this stuff. There's also a company called Hypersonics, who I met a couple of years ago at Space Symposium in Colorado Springs. These folks are working on a couple of different types of hypersonic vehicles, including the Hypersonics Dart, and also a vehicle called the Delta Velos, which will be capable of lofting payloads into low Earth orbit, and together with spaceport provider Southern Launch, Hypersonics is helping to cement South Australia's position as the next global aerospace hub after signing a memorandum of understanding to collaborate on a turnkey hypersonic testbed service. This was back in September of 2024. Very eager to find out what these folks have coming out next. Now, although New Zealand has definitely distinguished themselves as being the leaders in vertical launch in the Southern Hemisphere, indeed the number two company when it comes to vertical launch startup company, there's another company in Australia that most of you have probably heard of by now called Gilmore Space that's looking to provide Rocket Lab with a little bit of competition. And their Eris rocket is very similar in many respects to the Rocket Lab Electron in terms of its capabilities with a payload mass of up to 215 kilograms up to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit although to equatorial orbits this thing can actually carry over 300 kilograms now what you're looking at right now is their ambitions of an upgraded version of the Ares that will have a couple of boosters attached to it I think liquid boosters is what they have in mind right now they're trying to 
to avoid the heavily polluting solid rocket boosters. And look at that. You don't get anywhere in this industry by thinking small. Obviously, the moon is one of their targets. So definitely a company that's looking up in terms of their long-term ambitions. The problem is, as many of you probably heard, their first launch got really disrupted by a typhoon, which apparently caused some damage to the rocket. And even though that damage appeared to be corrected, at least at first, just a half an hour before the launch window opened on their first test flight, an unexpected issue had triggered the system that opened the rocket's fairing. And I don't know if the fairing actually plummeted to the ground or anything like that, but it appears that that's probably what happened and the fairing was either damaged or destroyed. And so a replacement fairing is being sent to the launch site and a full investigation is expected. We're not really sure as to how long this is going to delay the entire process for Gilmore, but still I have every confidence that these folks are going to be heading to space very soon. And speaking of companies who head to space on a regular basis from this region of the world, we of course have to talk about Rocket Lab. This company provides the world's only private orbital launch range. And of course, this launch range is located in Mahia, New Zealand. It's an FAA licensed spaceport and it can provide up to 120 launch opportunities every year. From this site, it's possible to reach orbital inclinations from sun-synchronous orbits through to 30 degrees, enabling a wide spectrum of inclinations to service the majority of the satellite industry's missions to low Earth orbit. And there have been customers all over the planet who have been taking advantage of this. There are also private range control facilities, two complete satellite clean rooms, which of course means that the company can handle two customers simultaneously and make back-to-back -back launches, utilizing in these clean rooms to integrate the vehicles, a launch vehicle assembly facility that can process multiple electrons at once, and administrative offices. Operating a private orbital launch site alongside its own range and mission control centers allows Rocket Lab to reduce the overhead cost per mission, resulting in a cost-effective launch service for satellite operators. And right now, it's difficult, if not impossible, to find a better dedicated cost to get a payload to orbit. If you want a mission that's dedicated to your payload, well, this is about the cheapest way to get the job done, as Varda, for example, is doing as they carry out microgravity experiments with various types of pharmaceuticals in low Earth orbit and then return those payloads back to Earth in a reusable vehicle. Now, Rocket Lab is officially an American company and they do have a second launch facility at Wallops Island that is primarily used for launching a military hypersonic test bed called the HASTE or the Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron. However, the vast vast majority of launches take place in New Zealand, which at the time of this recording has conducted 60 orbital launches, and it's going to surpass that milestone very, very soon. But once again, we're talking about a rocket that only carries about 300 kilograms or so to orbit. Granted, the Neutron is going to be able to carry much heavier payloads, but that's going to be launching from the United States. What sort of use are customers is going to have for a small rocket like Electron once Neutron enters service. Well, perhaps a company like this Australian company. The Sydney-based Space Machines Company specializes in building small spacecraft, and for the most part, these spacecraft are designed to quickly respond to emergency situations in low Earth orbit that involve malfunctioning satellites, satellites that may have experienced some sort of collision or malfunction, and so therefore are in danger of becoming unguided missiles in low Earth orbit, thus contributing to the growing space junk problem. So, 
this company is for the most part manufacturing spacecraft that either deal with space junk or maintain satellites, repair damaged satellites. And the idea is to provide a rapid response to a crisis situation. That's something you're not going to be able to do on a rideshare mission that's scheduled six months or a year or two years out. Instead, the best way for these kinds of spacecraft to be deployed rapidly into low Earth orbit is with a low-cost, dedicated mission with a small, low-payload rocket like Electron or the Gilmore Space Eris, which have fairings and payloads that are perfectly suited to these types of spacecraft. And just like the Europeans, the Australians appear to be taking the lead also when we're talking about space sustainability, either repairing satellites so they don't become space junk or disposing of satellites that have already become space junk, a problem that is going to eventually become a serious crisis if we don't start doing something about it now. And it's great to see that Australia is joining Europe in taking the lead in providing a solution to this growing problem. So I cannot wait to visit these two countries in September and October and bring you all the details about this bleeding edge space technology. And if you want to learn a little bit more about where we are in terms of getting me there in September, well, stay tuned and we're going to talk about it right now. So a quick update once again, I can't believe I've been updating this often, really didn't expect that this much would happen on such a regular basis that I would be able to update um, on this trip on pretty much a daily basis, but it's just happening. We're up to 36 percent of the total budget for this trip now having been filled by the viewers i am so very grateful for all of that and as a result i have now reserved my flight on september 11th yeah not the most auspicious day but it's an inexpensive day to fly september 11th i will be flying to sydney not arriving of course until a couple of days later but still really, really looking forward to it. If it wasn't for your support, I wouldn't have been able to make this flight reservation. Still have a ways to go to completely fund the trip, but I have a lot of confidence that we're going to get there between now and then. If it's something you'd like to support, as I say, you can support our GoFundMe, or you can support me on Patreon, or perhaps even pick up a piece of merchandise. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and until next time, stay angry about space.